Hi, thanks for having me. So uh, my name is Shannon Smith, and I am a platform services <laughs> specialist with WordPress VIP. So I help um, enterprise level clients use WordPress better. And one of the things we've been doing at WordPress VIP is going around to all of our clients and um, showing them how Gutenberg works. So we've done demos uh, with editorial boards, and we've shown our um, clients development teams how to use Gutenberg. We've been doing that for about a year. So uh, I thought I'd bring some of the stuff we've been talking about here and share that with you as well. Uh, first of all, what is Gutenberg? So I hope you saw the talk before. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I won't go over this in too much, too much detail, but basically Gutenberg is a new way of editing. So basically organizing your content into blocks, which you can organize the way you like, which can hold any different kind of content, which you can move around. Uh, so it's really easy to use, and it makes for a really great editorial experience. Um, why is this good? It's, um, it's consistent. You can dynamically shift all the content, and you can use block templates to guide content. So um, it lets you sort of focus on getting your content out to the world and less on coding it up. Uh, and we built something so that people can try right away, because uh, a lot of people would like to try Gutenberg, and they'd like to try it right now, but maybe they don't want to um, start up a whole new site and download a plugin, although it's really easy and, and you should definitely do that. But if you want to do it right now, you can go to a, a website we built. It's called testgutenberg.com and it has a demo of Gutenberg. You can't save, but you can use Gutenberg right now from your phone, from your uh, laptop and try out all the blocks. Um, and so we took this tool to some of the editorial boards that we, we went to visit and showed them how easy it was to use Gutenberg right now. And it looks like this. <laughs> All you need is some text and a couple pictures and you can get started. Um, so this talk is gonna be about how Gutenberg works under the hood. So this isn't a live demo, sorry to uh, break the streak. Um, if, this were, if Gutenberg were a car, we'd be looking under the hood, but I wouldn't be like replacing your transmission. Uh, and I'm going to talk about sort of the nuts and bolts of how it's all put together. So this talk is meant for everyone, but if you have a sort of a, a, a basic background in how themes or plugins work, then this should be right up your alley, but it should still be useful for people who have less knowledge than that. And, but on the other hand, if you're some sort of React genius, then this will be very easy and, and uh, yeah. <laughs> so a brief technical tour. So you can think of blocks sort of like plugins. And in fact, you can build plugins just with blocks, and you can build a plugin with just one block if you like. And the idea is to um, make all the core behavior of WordPress fit into these blocks. And it divides your content into an editorial layer and a data layer. So the editorial layer, that's all the React part. That's the part that makes the interface that lets you add content. And that is built on React and built by people who know how to use React well. But in order for you to build themes and plugins that work with this layer, you don't actually need to know that much React. Just like um, when you build themes and plugins with WordPress, you don't necessarily need to know a lot of PHP. You just need to know just enough PHP. And this is still WordPress. And so now that React's been built into this um, stack of technology, now you just need to know just enough React in order to do really, some really powerful things. And I'm going to talk to you about what those are. And this is sort of an illustration of how these things are isolated. So all the React is in the interface. It's not in the front end. So what that means, it, it's done this way on purpose. What that means is that it doesn't add a heavy load onto WordPress. It doesn't slow down WordPress. Because all the extra technology, even though it's, it's built to be performant, is built in the interface side. Even still, you can imagine how in a really um, large newsroom, for example, you might have you know, hundreds of reporters contributing stories, uh, you know, an entire editorial team, and the React infrastructure will still be able to support that number of users, but at the same time, the front end that, that um, your web visitors will see will still be just as fast as it always has. It won't affect that, really. So this is what the code looks like. Um, I'm gonna go through some smaller pieces. Um, but basically, 
Um, these are the, the small parts, and this is just sort of a sampling, so we'll look at everything in, in detail in a minute. Really cool stuff, reusable blocks. So the idea is, um, if you think of, for example, um, every time you sort of saved a snippet of code and then like copied and pasted it over and over again into say a widget or like the bottom of an article, for example, uh, you don't have to do that anymore and you can choose where it's used. So a great example is if you're an author, for example, you have a promo blurb and you want it to appear on a subset of, of articles but you don't want to necessarily have to tag them all or something like that, then you can have a reusable block that you can use in all those places. Uh, dynamic blocks, which work like PHP, which would be, for example, um, a list of top posts, the kind of thing that you see in widgets at the moment. Um, you can have backend-only blocks, so for example, an editorial block, you know, the little reminder, check your spelling, but it could be something much more complicated, like a checklist. Check your spelling, fact check this, uh, find the photos that go with this, etc. Um, and it can also be revenue or ad-aware blocks. So for example, those reusable blocks, that could be something that you could use for ads, for example. And another thing you do is block level locking. So the, the best example I can think of this is if you look at an e-commerce site. So you can have a template which has a series of blocks, but maybe you always want to list a price. You always want to have a photo, um, and you always want to have a text. But then some other things you might not have. So for example, you might not always have a whole gallery full of a whole bunch of photos, but you can require that price is always there. And likewise, you can require that something else is never there. So for example, one of the really cool blocks is verse. It's a poetry block. So it's really cool if you write poetry because it's not code. It's not formatted text that has to be in a, um, an ugly font. It's a pretty font. It looks good. Uh, but maybe that doesn't have as much of a place in an e-commerce site. Or maybe it does. You never know. Um, and so you can exclude that if you want to using code. So Gutenberg's really big. Um, Clock is a, a, a tool that you can use to see how much code is in something. Um, and so if you look at Gutenberg, <laughs> it's, uh, what is it, 48,000 lines of code? So that's really large. Uh, but just because it's so large doesn't mean it has to be so complex because in building themes and plugins, you're going to be interacting with a small part of that. So what is React? React is a, a tool for building interfaces. And that's the shortest version. Um, and it's an open source library. It's maintained by Facebook. Uh, and you can also get React Native, which works on, uh, on mobile devices. And sort of the very basic building block of, of React is a JSON literal. So if you look at the first one here, I've written a JSON literal for my t-shirt. Super simple. It has a logo for my company. <laughs> it's got a color, it's got a size, has sleeve, is false, it's got a Boolean in there. Um, so really simple. Now this literal obviously doesn't do anything. It just describes a reality, but you can see how it would be more simple. And the advantage of this sort of um, code is that it's human readable. You can see this and know what this means without um, having to parse a whole bunch of information or use special tools. And so that's one of the things that's being conserved in WordPress. And if you look at the second one, you can see how they've inserted JSON literals into the code. So what they've done is they've um, put the literals right inside of HTML comments. And the reason that was chosen as a strategy was so that the code would be um, standards compliant, but still readable and so you could still see it and see how it's changing. So it's kind of clever, um, and it's really simple. So this is uh, not as simple as my t-shirt, but you could have put my t-shirt in there. Okay. And the, um, the code that makes up blocks is designed in a tree. So you have several components inside of a larger structure, and each of the components um, indicates what happens. So you'll have a type, you'll have certain attributes, um, but in, if you look in the first one, uh, this is for a really simple type of, of blog post with a hero image up at the top. So the first one is an image block. The second one would be um, a paragraph. 
And you can also have where you see here, um, children Gutenberg posts aren't HTML. That's a title actually that goes with the photo over the photo. And you can use CSS to change how that looks. But what this does is links all the pieces together to, to show how they're related. So it doesn't just talk about um, the content as random content. It talks about the content in terms of structure and in terms of relationships. And it also lets you do things that you've always done with WordPress, like serialization. Um, it lets you find loops of data. So for example, you probably don't want to have just one post. You want, might want to show a series of posts, uh, for example, a list of categories or a list of top posts or anything else. And so you can use literals to show things in loops or a series of things or a certain number of things, just like you can with PHP. Um, so Gutenberg isn't actually HTML. It's something different that looks like HTML, but it's been built to follow the same rules that you're used to following when you build things with WordPress. And there's a whole um, post called Ship of Theseus, um, which I recommend you read, but the idea behind the Ship of Theseus is that um, Theseus, had a ship, Theseus had a ship, and then it was dismantled piece by piece, and then every piece was replaced by something else. Question is, is it still the Ship of Theseus? And it's a metaphorical question. Uh, and so this is still WordPress, but different pieces are being taken in and taken out in hopes that it will work in the same way, but better, but still follow a set of, um, not rules, but I don't know, conventions about what we think WordPress is and how we expect to be able to interact with it. Okay, and templates. So um, templates are a way of organizing blocks. And again, the example with e-commerce is a good one because you'll have certain types of blocks that would fit in there. But another example would be, for example, if you have a cooking site. You want to have recipes, you want to have a title, but you also want to have an ingredients block. You want to have a directions block, you want to have a series of photos, etc. And so you can design a template with specific types of blocks that you can use in order to build a website. You can have several of these at once. You can combine these into a theme or a set of plugins, uh, depending on what you want to do. And again, you can use template locks. Uh, you can assign templates to post types so that all recipes use a certain set of blocks. But for example, if you have a cooking blog, you might have uh, travel entries where you're not going to use ingredients. And so there's a different set of blocks for that and you can build all of this. You can also use nested templates so that you have, um, for example, if you're using, uh, say, a travel site, you can have in there a review block that appears when you want it to. And the idea is that this is supposed to be compatible with what already exists so that you don't have to learn a whole bunch of new things and so that everything's backward compatible. So some of the things that people um, have expressed concern about um, are short codes, post types, meta boxes. These are things you probably read blog posts about. <laughs> um, so short codes still work just the way they are now. There's actually a short code block, so you can just put your short code in there, and it'll just work. Um, custom post types also work, and I have a little bit of code to show you for that as well. And there's a whole bunch of different ways that make meta boxes be supported. But there's also ways to turn off Gutenberg if you prefer not to use it. One is to switch the classic editor. But another thing that um, our team has done is we've built a plugin. It's called Gutenberg Ramp. And what it does is allows you to selectively use Gutenberg where it's useful. So for example, if you were a big newsroom, you might say, well, um, our features department has all this interactive content. We want to really utilize that. We want to have magazine style layouts. We want to have images, media, um, and so we can use Gutenberg there. But our breaking news department, like we have to do that now and we have to keep going, so we'd like to turn that off for the time being until we all get ramped up to using Gutenberg all the time. And that's an open source plugin that anyone can use. So short codes are just the same. Um, they work in the same place. Uh, custom post types um, can also be built using Gutenberg. So here's one. Uh, this is for a book 
post type. And it tells you all the things that you're used to saying, uh, except that the, the content is perhaps more structured. And it's the same thing you're used to seeing where you register the type of post type, uh, just like before. So these are supported by Gutenberg. Um, and you can use them in uh, API calls. Um, you can opt out of them if you want. And um, you can de declare supported and default blocks in them. Metaboxes are another thing that people have been talking a lot, and there's different ways that you can use metaboxes. You can use a sort of a classic style metabox, so it's the same as before. Um, or you can convert some metaboxes to blocks. Uh, metaboxes can contain, um, um, what is it, uh, post-meta information. So sometimes what you're doing with metaboxes might be better done with a block, but it depends on the situation. And um, a lot of like the larger plugins now uh, are being converted to Gutenberg. And so a really good example is the Yoast plugin. Um, as far as the user's concerned, it looks like a series of metaboxes, and those have all been converted to Gutenberg. So I remember like the first time I installed it with Gutenberg, and I was like, oh, I don't know how this is going to work. And of course, it was just working. Yay. <laughs> and you can force backwards compatibility um, with a little bit of code. So just that little bit of code where it says um, block editor compatible metabox false just tells Gutenberg don't convert this one to Gutenberg. Just leave it the way it is. Make it the old style. Well, the current style, but <laughs> classic WordPress, I guess. Uh, and one of the things I think is super exciting is um, what you can do with themes with like this tiny snippet of code. Um, I'm sure you've all seen uh, a theme design where you know, they're using one shade of purple, and then someone like just puts something in, and it's just like it's just like slightly different, and it's like so irritating. Um, and you know, they're trying really hard, but at the same time, it's like really visible because it's so close and yet different. And so now, what you can do with themes is set a series of colors to be used in blocks. So in this theme, it's a purple color palette. Whereas the default theme is, you know, sort of more rainbowy, and in any case, you always get the multicolor option at the end. But you can set this with like the three or four default colors that you want people to use all the time. So if you're doing this for a site which has a lot of branding, you can choose the brand colors so that every link is uh, WordPress blue, for example, and just make that available to users to make it easier for them to choose the right color without like hunting for a code or having to change everything. Um, and so this is really, really cool. And it means that when you put like this teeny amount of code in, um, all of your themes will just have a much more professional, um, professionally styled look. So uh, blocks, what do they look like? So this is uh, a really basic block um, <laughs> sorry, and this is one from the Gutenberg hand, Handbook, which is a really cool tool for you to start learning how to use uh, Gutenberg and get started right away. But basically what it is, is it tells you to register this block, like announce that it exists, and then it tells you uh, like what it is basically. So super simple. Um, this is another example where uh, or hang on. Yeah, so here you've registered the block type. You've told people what qualities it has. So for example, it has a title. This is a type of block called Hello World. This type of block has a little icon that you can see. It's when you use Gutenberg there in the side column, you can see like a different icon for paragraph, quote, et cetera. And so you can set the icon you'd like to use. Uh, you can tell what type of block it is and you can tell what it does. <laughs> You can also set block styles. So you can do this right, using, right in your style sheets using uh, CSS. And it can be really simple so that everything that's a um, ingredients block uses a smaller font, for example. Uh, and so this is, uh, well, 
the same thing together with the registration and um, and all the things you need to style it. So you set the styling as Gutenberg boilerplate ES5 step two, um, but it's the same. It's the style you need to be able to then later attach styles to your block. Another part of the code is the um, attributes. So what this tells Gutenberg is what the components are, what type of information this is. And so if you have an image, you can tell WordPress that there's, there's a link address, that this is an image, et cetera. It makes it useful because it categorizes the data that's being put into WordPress so that it keeps everything together, but also so you can pull it out using an API, for example, and still have everything uh, work together properly and be reconstructed afterwards. So you can have editable fields attributes. You can also build much more interesting, complex things using, using this, like toolbars and inspectors, and you can create dynamic blocks, which do things, like I mentioned before, like take a list of categories, and there'll be all kinds of things that get built when people start using it. Um, as much as they've been using PHP technology that, that has existed before. Um, and you also have this really cool tool where you can um, create your, your um, blocks right from the command line. So you can use WordPress CLI using something called scaffold, input all the information you want your block to have and build a block just like that. So if you're more of a command line type, you can make it really quick. And the idea is, um, how do you win at Go? Is that you lose your first 50 games as quickly as possible, and that's how you get good. So <laughs> how you get good at Gutenberg is you build, well, hopefully not 50 plugins, but um, you have to fail a little bit in your practicing time in order to really learn all the techniques. So uh, one of the like, best strategies for learning more is to take this technology, open it up when it doesn't count on your own computer or your own like silly site and, um, and start building things right away because you'll see how all the parts fit together and how they don't and how to fix things. So uh, the beta is supposed to be released on October 19 with a release date of November 19. So that's coming up soon. Um, but you can start using this right now and you can also opt out like I mentioned before. There's sort of a four-phase um, plan for what comes when. Uh, so what I just described with the November 19 date is the post-editing experience. So posts and pages, but after that, there'll be entire site layouts. And the idea is to put the navigation into blocks and put the kinds of things that you would see in widgets right now into blocks as well. And then phase three and phase four are gonna be announced at WordCamp US, so I guess we'll all find out. Uh, and I have a bunch of um, interesting tools and resources that you might uh, want to check out to learn more. So one of them is uh, Human Made has a really good white paper on how to use um, Gutenberg. And again, I'll let you um, download all my slides. So I'm going to tweet them later and so you don't have to take notes or anything. Gutenberg News is a website that has a lot of information on Gutenberg and it's updated all the time. Um, a lot of people want to know if their plugins are compatible with Gutenberg, and there's something called the Gutenberg Plugin Compatibility Project, and the best thing about this is that this is an open source, collaborative, community-driven effort where you can go and tell people if a plugin works, if it doesn't, you can test plugins, and you can say how a plugin may or may not work. What's interesting about this is that a lot of um, plugins don't actually interact with the the um, dashboard interface, and so they work right away. And whereas other ones need a little bit more work, and some of them just need small tweaks, and this way you can uh, contribute to a bunch of knowledge over what is compatible and what isn't. And of course, you can contribute yourself. So um, not everyone is a React genius, but the Gutenberg project also needs people to help with other things, so translation, documentation, um, talks like this, <laughs> but also learning initiatives, and all of those are contributions to the WordPress community, and they're all valuable. So if this is something that you're interested in, then I would encourage you to 
participate. And also one of the things that's great about Gutenberg is like right now we're entering a beta stage and then uh, a re release candidate stage, but there's still time to influence how it gets built and what happens. So if you think one aspect of Gutenberg is more important, or if you would like to see um, more of X, then it's a great time for you to come and say, wait, we want this, or how can I help build, you know, ABC? Um, so I'd like to make sure I leave lots of time for questions. Uh, and just before I do, I should also mention that uh, WordPress VIP is hiring. So if this is something that uh, interests you, maybe come see me afterwards. But uh, questions about this? Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear. Um, like, do you mean when you're using WordPress? Uh, you won't need to know that much about React to make WordPress work properly. Basically, what it, what, what Gutenberg includes is the React library and then a special um, interaction layer to make WordPress interact with React. And those are part of Gutenberg that are going to be uh, folded into core for November 19, ideally. Uh, and so those are the parts that you'll need. So ideally you won't need to, I mean, I think maybe the PHP version uh, is, is up for consideration for a higher um, base level, but you won't need a lot of extra technology to make this work or to code for it uh, in the back. Um, so the question is, um, is that there's a tool that you can use to convert shortcodes to two blocks, essentially. Um, and the question was, will we still need shortcodes in the future? So in the short term, the idea is that shortcodes will continue to work. You don't need to do anything. But in the long term, the idea is that blocks will replace shortcodes. Uh, and so that you won't need them anymore. But, and Part of the reason is that that's going to be a more, um, more interactive user experience for the user because they're going to be able to see what's happening. Because the interface, it isn't exactly what you see on the website, but it mimics that quite closely. And so if a short code is meant to be interactive, you'll conserve that interactivity. Yeah. It should work as before. So um, you'll still be able to use the parts of WordPress that you're familiar with, like categories and tags and, and most of the short codes, and you can still use the old style meta boxes. So a lot of this doesn't actually change. It changes the interface experience for the user. But in terms of how WordPress is put together, the idea is that it's fully backward compatible, um, both in terms of the code and what is produced on the web and also what happens with the API as well. Yeah. So for even for really complex websites, um, it's still working the way you expect it to do. And, and it's fully functional. I mean, there are so sites that are launched now that use Gutenberg that you can go see in their live large sites. And they're still using all the functionality that, that WordPress has always offered and a lot of the same plugins. Um, a lot of the really large plugin makers have already converted to Gutenberg and um, even a lot of the smaller ones as well. Um, so you can do what you were doing before mostly. 
Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Uh, you said that you're trading one of ten or five of mm -hmm. um, What are the uh, major stumbling blocks, so to speak, uh, for a student or, or uh, where do you find uh, that ten or five getting hung up? Or is there anything that, like recurring themes that maybe we can train our clients on to get better that you should focus on? Sure. Um, so usually what happens is when we take Gutenberg to a large, for example, a media client, is the editorial team gets really excited. I mean, this is just kind of fun and easy to use, and you can get started right away and you don't have to learn new skills, and things just look good, and just the whole idea where, um, you know, the web is less boxy uh, and more, like, dynamically controllable by the user, while still con con containing all of the sort of um, consistency of a nice professional layout, um, that's really, really appealing. And a lot of the media clients we're working with have really large editorial departments, so there's a lot of hands on all the content, and anything that makes it more consistent is really useful. So the idea where you can limit the theme choices to um, a certain color range, for example, that's really appealing. Uh, so that looks really good. Um, and then for the development team, I think the idea is that, um, that people have invested a lot of time and energy and money into making websites work the way they want them to. And so people are a bit concerned about how they're going to do that with Gutenberg. And I think like something like the Gutenberg hand Handbook is really good because it explains sort of the translation of most of the basic components. It won't trans... It won't translate everything. I mean, plugins can do everything, right? They can do anything at all. So uh, some plugins are going to take more work than others. But I think especially for theme development, the kind of changes that people are going to have to make are really minor. And so I think as soon as people see like the code that they actually have to interact with next to the code that they're using now, it's, it's fairly reassuring because it's, this is still WordPress. This isn't some new thing. You don't have to be... Um, you know, a React genius to make all of this work. Um, although, you can always be a React genius, but you don't need to be. So, it's, I think that's um, like talking about, talking to developers about how the code's going to be slightly different but function the same. And so your whole mindset isn't going to have to change and you're not going to have to learn a huge new base of new technology to get started now. Yeah. Yeah. Is the development or the use of React inside very similar to normal React development where we have to worry about state and props and everything like that? Or is it like have has that been abstracted from us in the So there's an abstraction layer, yes. Uh, so if you're building Gutenberg, then yeah, you do. And the abstraction layer has some I don't know, correlates to how WordPress works. But you don't need to understand props and state in order to work with it. So I didn't talk about it on purpose <laughs> because it's not necessary to your knowledge to be able to do what most people are going to want to do. So if you're building themes, you don't need to know that part about React, although it's useful from a comprehension type of uh, point of view and also if you wanted to contribute to any type of React project, including the core part of WordPress that um, that Gutenberg's part of, and also that is going to become larger, then yes, it's, it's very useful. But you don't need that to get started. So I'm guessing the VSX doesn't really have a place really inside of this as well. Um, I'm not sure. I, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I, yeah, and Tisha, yeah. Um, yeah. So what happens at the moment is if you install Gutenberg, it doesn't switch your old content. It's conserved the way it is. And you can, you can choose to go in and switch them if you want to. But for a lot of people, what's more important is that their content is still whole, that you can still consult it as a reader. And 
um, for a lot of people, like they're not necessarily editing old content. So you can just leave that. That will just still work just as before. And the classic editor is built in, so you can make any new article work like it does now on an article-by-article -article basis. Or you can use something like Gutenberg Ramp, where you can turn it off for, uh, for certain posts or for a category of posts or for a type of um, post type. And so you can just turn it off for all of those ones if you wanted to. Um, so we're using, we're, we built something called Gutenberg Ramp. It's a plugin that allows you to be more selective about what is Gutenbergified and what is not. Um, yeah? So uh, do you have any recommendations for like a plugin which has, uh, or no, sorry, like a template of some sort which builds a basic uh, custom Gutenberg block for a custom post type, for example? So say you have like product custom post type and you want to create yeah. a gallery, um, if you've got something worth building with best practices, because I'm sure it's been all over the place. Like so if you look at the Gutenberg handbook, it will go through it one by one. And they also have example codes for basic types of block, like just a, a block with a title and a paragraph to um, more complicated things. And you can just copy them because everything is um, done in, in literals that you can read. And so you can just copy out the parts and, and add more. So for example, if you wanted to have, um, and, and also look at Gutenberg code itself, but if you look at the handbook, it just sort of isolates the parts you need so that you can make sure that you have, for example, um, you know, that cool icon you want. Okay, you need this line. And then you just add the icon that you're using. And you can use the icons that are already in WordPress. You don't need to, like, you don't need to mess around with fancy fonts, but you can import your own image, for example. But that's sort of the best way to learn because it has everything set up really nicely and does the sort of correlation between the two ways of thinking about WordPress so that you can jump to the next step. Uh, any other questions? Yes. So it's still compliant HTML that's on the front end. All the React is happening in the back end. <laughs> you only need to build it once, and that will create what happens on the front end and how you interact in the, in the uh, Gutenberg editing interface. But it's mostly for the interface, but it's giving it structure. And then you would use CSS to give the structure the appearance you want. So it's doing, like, it's doing the right thing. It's isolating um, content from appearance, but it's also giving structure to the content so that you can tell what type of information it is. So it's sort of like a, it's sort of similar to like a lot of other ways of documenting how content is categorized, like um, open, open graph and schema and uh, all kinds of ways of categorizing information, uh, except that now it's like in the code and so you can reconstruct it as well. And that's super useful when you're doing something with APIs because you can um, reorganize but also reconstruct afterwards the pieces of the information that you're using. Uh, you can, yeah. yeah. You can do that, but it would probably not necessarily be recommended because then the user isn't gonna get the same experience when they're editing as what they're gonna see on the web. So ideally, just like now, um, it's good when the editor and uh, the final result look like one another because people find it easier to interact that way. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. It depends which page builder you use. So different page builders are differently integrated with Gutenberg at the moment. But there are a lot that are already um, integrated now. So Beaver Builder is an example. 
where they're using the functionality that Gutenberg provides, but then providing like extra features on top of that. And other people are doing things where they're providing um, like custom themes that work with their set of plugins, for example. So it really depends on the page builder you're using. And the best thing to do is to contact the developers of the specific page builder and ask what they recommend. Because it could be different for each one. Yeah. Sorry, no. Um, Um, I don't know, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I guess it depends. Like, I, I'd have to see, like, at this point, I need to see more sites that are fully built in Gutenberg to be able to, to, to answer that. And also, I think, like, once you start seeing, you know, all the blocks that exist for, like, what we would now put in the sidebar, if it was a really traditional blog, but accessory content, um, how that's all going to be integrated as well. So. Uh, we'll see what happens, I guess. I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm sure the, the development team knows. Um, <laughs> I don't know the answer. I'm sorry. Um, any more questions? Yes. Are we always going to have the ability to turn off Gutenberg and always have the ability to use Classic Editor? Or will there be a time where there's no more Classic Editor? This is what we offer. Well, I think the idea is that people are hoping that Gutenberg will be so good that people won't want to use the classic editor. Um, I'm not sure what sort of timeline there is for a switch like that. So I wouldn't want to guess. Yes. I'm, I'm very much an analyst of this stuff. So OK. Yeah. So right now you can install it as a plugin and then uninstall it. Um, but what I'd recommend is that you have a, a staging site or development site where you take your theme and uh, some of your data and then set it up and then play with it with the idea of breaking it. So the idea is you want to see how much you can do to break it and then fix it so it can't be broken that way. That's the idea. So it's the, it's the 50 games of Go. You know, because um, once you see it, it, it might not be as, um, like I see some developers saying, oh, this is going to be onerous, but it doesn't really have to be. And you don't really know until you actually try it. So a good thing to do is set up a, a, a local development site, try it out, uh, install the plugins that you're using now, install Gutenberg, see what works already and what doesn't work, and how you can make everything work the way you want it to. Yeah. The non-WordPress competitors are, are uh, visual editors now, like Wix. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that uh, Gutenberg will become a visual, uh, visual editor at some point? Um, well, it, I mean, it is a visual editor, um, but it's not the same type of product. I mean, I mean, I think that one of the very best things about WordPress is that um, you can leave. I mean, WordPress doesn't keep all your data, you can always take it all and you can build it the way you want it to. It's an open source project. If, um, if you didn't like the way WordPress was going, you could fork the project and people have. Um, you can always take your data and move it to a different installation. You can change all the plugins. You can take a plugin and build one that you think uh, works better for you. Um, all of these possibilities are open and that's not like uh, some of the competing visual design interfaces where it's, it's not made by and in the service of the community, uh, whereas WordPress is very different that way. I mean, open source, right? But so I think WordPress has this really great advantage because we can build what we need, not what a small group of people need. So it's, it's very powerful. Um, uh, here and then in the back, yeah. It 
it depends entirely on the theme. So some themes, um, especially ones that are really simple, it will just work right away. Um, other ones that are more complex, you might not find that. So it's always good to test. And of course, when um, version 5.0 of WordPress comes out, it will come with a new theme, which is Gutenberg ready. Um, it comes with basic CSS, yes. So it will have a look, just like the ones that have shipped with um, like 2010 and up. They, they look like something, and some of them are, are meant for different purposes, but they're fairly minimalist, all of them. Um, and so I expect it will be um, similar. But a lot of the themes that exist now already work. So it really depends theme by theme. Um, there was another question. Yeah. Um, so, when you're using this with an API, you might have to, like it depends what you're using, how you're using it, you might have to design your own custom endpoints to get the information that you want and be able to put it together the way you want to. Um, and it's still being built right now, so we'll find out for certain, November 19, I guess, but um, it should be really similar to what people are used to doing. Okay, then yeah, it should be the same. Like it should work in a similar way because basically you're using WordPress. Like what is being manipulated in the interface is then being mirrored in the code. And it's the code that, that is being pulled out. Well, the API is more complicated than that, but um, that translation works for the API in the same way it works for the translation to HTML. Yeah. What has been your biggest aha moment in working with you? Um, hmm. That's tricky. Um, I guess my biggest aha was the same thing that, because um, I used to work as a developer, um, as a freelancer, and I listened to all these blog posts that said it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be so difficult, like you're never gonna be able to do it, uh, and this is wrong. And, um, and then I went to actually look at the code, and it wasn't that bad. Like it still preserves the, I guess, the mindset. So when I look at the code that's now going to interact with React, my brain thinks about it the same way. So it's not so new. You know, like there's a couple extra things, but you know, WordPress evolves constantly. It's never like a, a, a stationary thing. And so I was actually really impressed that the, the backwards compatibility in terms of the concepts was preserved. So I guess that was the, the biggest thing that I noticed. Um, yeah. Um, would you like to speak to the accessibility issue that Wharton brought up this morning? Yeah, well, I'm not... So I'm not on the, the team that builds Gutenberg one, so I can't, um, like in a way I can't speak to what will happen, um, although, I mean, to an extent part of it is uh, people power and if enough people contribute their time and effort that would improve things. Um, and so, but that's not all of it, like that's not the, there's more complex um, things going on and because I'm not on the team, like it's really difficult for me to say, well I think this will happen or I think it would be better like this. Um, so yeah, it's tricky. I mean obviously, personally I think accessibility is super important. I mean I also agree that like part of this whole project is to make something that represents all of us. Um, but like I'm not the one who's actually coding it up either. So it's hard to make that jump to um, say, oh, well, we could do it this way or we could do this other thing. 
Um, so even though, like, I work at Automatic, but I'm not, I'm not on the community building team. I'm not on the, the core team that's building this. Um, and I know people are working really hard also. Like, this is a really um, intense work that people have been putting in really a lot of hours over a really extended period of time. Um, so, yeah, but like as a community, we could probably come up with ways to improve the whole thing, and we should. I mean, I think we should all put in time and effort as we're able and as we are, have benefited from. I said that. Mm -hmm. On Bloomberg um, GitHub, like the issues are there and tagged as accessibility. So if you're wondering, like, what are the concerns? Um, there's a lot of blog posts, but you can mm -hmm. go directly and see what tickets are filing and what <coughs> they are working on and what's yeah. progress. You can see, like, there's just so many tickets and, like, lots have been closed. Like, mm -hmm. like, there's progress. Yeah, and you can do that too. I mean, if you see errors, bugs, uh, things you'd like to be improved, um, I mean, people are encouraged to participate in the GitHub uh, repo and um, log the things they see and any sort of changes they like to see happen. And if you have patch suggestions, like all of that is welcome. So if that's something you're into, um, definitely participate. But also, if you're into participating in another way, it, like it's not just code based, it's also documentation, translation. Um, like even um, like WordPress ships with a Canadian English translation that's not always at 100%. So um, I always ask, you know, if you speak two languages, but also if you speak Canadian English, um, <laughs> then you can contribute to that translation as well. Yeah. Um, so, I, again, it's a community decision, uh, so I, I didn't choose the date, <laughs> um, and I can't really speak to that. I know there's a backup date as well, uh, which is January, and that even those dates have a, I think it's eight or nine day leeway. Um, so, I mean, it's rare, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty common that WordPress uh, dates are off by a couple days. I mean, that's a pretty a typical thing. Um, so I like the eight or nine days. I wouldn't like that. Seems well within the range of of what we've seen before. And I think the next date uh, in January is meant to. Um, I mean, I assume it's meant to avoid the holiday season. But um, yeah, I, I mean, as always, it's documented in the you know makewordpress.org. You can see what's happening, or you can visit the Slack channel where people actually have the discussions. And I mean, there's, there's the back scroll, you can see what people have said, and you can contribute to the discussion and, and, and all that. So that's the place to look. <laughs> yeah. Well, I see lots of people um, in the Slack channel looking to see. Um, and also, I mean, uh, just the whole thing where, where um, WordPress 5.0, like there's a lot of other things besides Gutenberg and WordPress 5.0 that people are waiting for and would really like to see. Um, and so and I know people are following that Slack channel like fairly closely. <laughs> uh, so that's, the, that's where you would find that information. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, so I'm here. If you have other questions, please come see me. And again, uh, we're hiring. If that's something you're interested, please come get a hiring card. <laughs>